Hello everyone. Welcome for to the session, the second planning session of this afternoon. And we will start with a very interesting talk about the gamma rays, uh, the state of the air detection of gamma rays from, from the space, from Regina Caputo from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So I give the floor to her. Um, please uh, start as you wish. Thank you for the uh, introduction. I'll go ahead and, and uh, assuming you can all see my slides. Perfect, okay. <laughs> I, I love it when things seem to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I was uh, asked to give the uh, an overview of the gamma rays uh, astronomy uh, from space in the, in the conference this week. Um, and so I'll go ahead and get started. And so I have to start out because this is a really broad topic by just saying that, you know, this is a best effort to cover a lot of different things. There's a, a really broad spectrum of a gamma ray astronomy that comes from space. And so trying to cover it in, you know, 20, 25 minutes is, is nearly impossible. Uh, I have my science biases, and so you'll see those. And, uh, you know, an apology to anything that I might not have included. Um, it's just, like I said, my bias is coming through. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the conference organizers. I know organizing virtual conferences is very challenging, um, and I think this has been a very fruitful and rewarding experience so far. And also especially thank you to the conference support staff. Uh, none of this would be possible without you guys helping us out with Zoom and everything else. So thank you very much. So um, I also wanted to say that like there's, there's a little bit of a difficulty in, you know, where do you do the gamma ray direct split from the gamma ray indirect? And so I had, you know, some, some fun chats with Gabby about the best way is to try to divide up this topic because usually sources don't care what is observing them. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, they're, they're going to produce things uh, in, in whatever energy range they want. And so um, what we have decided, kind of very loosely speaking, is, um, is I'll focus a lot on the extra galactic sources and really space-based gamma ray instrumentation because this field has gotten very diverse. And then uh, Gabby will be focusing mostly on the ga ground-based gamma ray instrumentation and then more the galactic sources. And so, like I said, you know, the, the field of gamma ray astronomy from space uh, is, is a very rich and diverse field, and it's changed a lot over the years. You know, just even five years ago, you would be looking at maybe half of these uh, instruments, the, you know, taking data and producing catalogs. And so, you know, now we have lots of rich options to choose from, um, not just, you know, we have a lot of free flying instruments that have been flying for longer than a decade. Uh, I think the Fermi Observatory is really the premier gamma ray instrument. Uh, we also have a lot of balloon instruments, uh, instruments on the space station. A lot of the cosmic ray instruments are also producing a lot of interesting gamma ray results as well. And so it's really a very rich field with a lot of data to, to look at and, and observe uh, these different sources. And so, you know, to give you the overview summary uh, at the beginning, so you could know where I'm going with this talk, it's just that the landscape over the years has matured a lot. There's a lot, many, many gamma ray telescopes in space, and there's many tools available to analyze the data, and most importantly, to combine the data and cross-check among different instruments. So a lot of results have been observed using many different gamma ray telescopes, and this is not something that was possible something like, you know, five years ago. Um, but of course, when you have more telescopes, you get more data and then there's more questions. So it's just showing the real richness and depth of the field. Um, and I think to answer these questions, there's uh, many, many people looking towards the future to try to develop the next generation of, of gamma ray telescopes from space. And so I think there's really, this is a great time to be involved in gamma ray astrophysics because there's a lot of opportunities for new space-based gamma ray missions. And so now we'll dive in um, some extra galactic transient science. And so some of the really interesting research uh, has been looking at, you know, central engine, engines of fast transients. And so these are gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts. And one of the main outstanding questions has been from, uh, you know, GRB polarization. So are gamma ray bursts polarized? And this tells us about the central engine and the properties of, the, of these um, 
of these uh, sources. And so there have been a number of observatories who've been, you know, launched directly to measure the uh, polarization. And the most recent results that were just presented at ICRC uh, came from Polar. And what they saw is that most of the GRBs that they detected don't show a high percentage of polarization. And this seems to be in at least somewhat conflict with the recent AstroSat measurements. And so I know that the teams are working together to try to understand these, the, to understand what's going on with these discrepancies, and in particular investigate the GRBs um, where there was overlap or both were able to observe them. Um, in addition, Polar 2 is scheduled to fly in the next few years, and hopefully this will give some more insight as to, you know, uh, GR, the more information about the diversity of GRBs and whether or not these are polarized. So in, in addition to GRB polarization, there's also lots of really interesting science going on with gamma reverse in general um, because of how exciting uh, GRB 170817A was. This was the gamma reverse that was detected with the neutron star mergers um, that LIGO detected uh, that really kicked off the whole multi-messenger astrophysics uh, community. Um, and so there's been look, the, we've been looking for analogs to these uh, kinds of gamma ray bursts. And there have been a few that have come up that show very similar uh, characteristics in the light curve. Uh, specifically, you know, a short non-thermal pulse at early times. So you're looking at, you know, the early times of the gamma ray burst and then a softer thermal component at late times. And so you see these highlighted in the blue and the red. And so this is something that's of, of a lot of interest to the community is to looking for these kinds of gamma ray bursts that have popped up um, throughout the you know thousands of gamma ray bursts that have been detected. Um, beyond looking for 170878 analogs, um, there's also an interest in finding precursors. And so um, there's been analyses of you know, all of the sets of, of, of GRBs to see if there are precursors in the time duration. And so there's a little bit of um, you know, number of occurrences and then the period of uh, pre-trigger pre time of these uh, precursors. Um, also, excitingly, we have uh, statistics on so many GRBs that there might be a third class of GRBs. And so this is a, a question of, you know, could this be a different classification? Um, these are very short, very bright bursts that last on the order of milliseconds. And so the question is, you know, are these magnetar giant flares? Um, specifically looking at GRB uh, 20.04.15a, uh, that is a, you know, kind of the poster child for these very kind of short, very bright bursts. And so additionally, looking back in the data and looking for analogs to these to try to understand what the source of this could be. And so there's many data of these uh, going on as well. So can staying in the extra galactic uh, universe, um, but now going from transients to more constant gamma ray sources, uh, we take a look at uh, active galaxies. And so, you know, there's um, kind of the, when you think of uh, AGN, you think of kind of the typical kind of double hump uh, spectral energy distribution. Uh, you see, you know, some uh, EBL attenuation, and you're look, you know, look to see where possibly neutrinos could be produced. Um, this is particularly exciting in the, uh, in addition to or in the multi messenger context of seeing if AGN could also produce neutrinos in addition to um, in addition to uh, you know the the high energy uh, photons that they produce, and so a typical model for AGN. Uh, that has kind of been the standard practice is this one on the upper left that's the synchro synchrotron self Compton uh, with external Compton models where you get this nice double leptonic bump. But if we want to try to explain a neutrino production, then we also need to have a hadronic component. And there's a few different ways that you could get these hadronic components in. And so this is just a, a few examples of how the hadronic components could uh, come in to play to produce neutrinos. And so, like I said, there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, interesting follow-up on the emission regions, uh, trying to understand, for example, uh, using the TXS0506 plus 056 source, which was the source that was flaring at the time when ISQ detected the high energy neutrino in 2017. Um, looking at the EBL attenuation of the very high energy cutoff um, is uh, to, to try to understand exactly where the emission regions are. Uh, there've been a lot of analyses 
um, that say, you know, potentially one, a one zone synchrotron self Compton model is not sufficient to try to explain the full emission regions. Um, and so, you know, you need additional zones uh, where synchrotron is being produced. And so that's, um, you know, pretty really active trying to understand. And in order to understand this, you need a full multi wavelength analysis. You really can't just look at one energy range. Um, there's also lots of, uh, you know, stacking analyses to try to understand uh, the gamma ray emission from uh, ultra fast outflows of active galaxies. And, you know, this was an analysis done to try to look for, uh, you know, another potential source of ice cube neutrino fluxes. Um, and so this is a pretty active and exciting um, research area. And so um, active galaxies in particular from a multi-wavelength context, I heard um, recently in a, in a conference, somebody say the uh, describe AGN as having relentless multi-wavelength variability. And so really what you need um, to fully appreciate these sources is uh, long-term mon monitoring across many wavelengths. So X-rays, gamma rays in space, ground-based gamma rays, radio, the full electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and in order to, you know, really understand where the particles are being accelerated, this is kind of the, the way that you need to understand this. Um, additionally, understanding polarizations, this is a signature of, of acceleration mechanisms. And so all of these things are important pieces of the puzzle. And so now zooming out from outside of, uh, outside of our galaxy to coming into our galaxy, um, one of the, I think, most most interesting questions uh, that you know the Fermi uh, Observatory has has had over its years of observing is is observing the galactic center to try to understand um, you know what exactly is happening, and uh, Dampe uh, oh, for the first time was able to release uh, their five year line search. Um, and so just looking for evidence of dark matter annihilation from lines, and they uh, were able to confirm what Fermi had observed um, already, and that there was no consistent lines that they observed. Um, there was a Chandra data follow-up uh, that the, the question was, you know, do millisecond pulsars um, explain the whole galactic center excess? And basically, uh, the Chandra data was a bit inconclusive. It doesn't say that the millisecond pulsar data uh, is the full answer or not. And so they just need additional radio follow-up. Um, and then also, you know, trying to understand the Fermi bubbles, uh, looking at the spectrum uh, from at the higher energy range is, is the center of our galaxy also a high energy particle accelerator? And it seems as though, you know, there's a lot of evidence of a pevatron at the galactic center. Um, and so uh, continuing with the Fermi bubbles, Dampe also has their first results of the Fermi bubbles, and they see things that are consistent with the LAT results. Um, there have been uh, a lot of analyses uh, to try to understand uh, the gamma ray components um, of these uh, radio loops as well. And so there's a lot of questions of, of, of Can I hear Regina anymore? I don't know if I'm the only one. Okay, so we have a problem with Regina. Let's see if uh, this can be recovered. Okay, let's, let's give her just some five minutes to see if we can reconnect. 
Well, there were big signs on this shoes. Meanwhile, meanwhile, yes, let's, let's uh, let me just uh, give some comments. I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in, the, in the point that the polar, uh, polar tooth playing, in fact, the uh, polar session is very interesting. Uh, I'm sure on this now. A lot of people working on, on the field, as far as I know. Uh, one thing that I really would like to know from her is if there's some, some mission uh, for seeing to improve the resolution and to get to uh, layers in at least. From that, I'm sure you have many, many things on your mind too. So in any case, even if uh, she's not able to reconnect, I will encourage you just to put questions in the forum later, such that uh, uh, we can have discussions uh, outside of the of the, this this current channel. So let's probably still wait a couple more of minutes, and I think if she cannot connect, uh, we can move to the next uh, next session. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Oh my goodness, my computer restarted. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I think that we can continue. I just uh, maybe have to ask you if you can be a, move a bit faster. Absolutely. Yeah. No. 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 No problem. Let's see. Thanks so um, much. <laughs> my, my apologies. No yeah. I no guess problem. This, this is one of the the dangers, I guess, of the virtual conferences. I I tend to not restart myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yes, I'll go quickly to try to keep on time. Um, so I was talking about the Galactic Center, um, but also then jumping to a new thing, catalogs, tools, and analysis packages. Uh, in the census of gamma ray sources, there have been a lot of really exciting new um, new source catalogs that have been coming through. I think the most complete of which is the Fermi source catalog. Uh, there's also the 10 year transient catalog, the low energy lag catalog. And what this has really allowed us to do is a lot of population, uh, population studies. Um, and to do that also, there have been a lot of really amazing analysis methods that have been developed that have really launched a lot of the gamma ray analyses very far into the future into what we could do. Um, I think one of the most exciting things to come out of the new release of the 4FGL is this uh, new sources that show distinct features that set them apart from different classes of other gamma ray emitters. And this is this unassociated source class. And I think it's very exciting to try to understand what exactly these sources might be. Um, and so this is just a summary. There's a, a few other sources and I'm gonna go quickly to try to um, you know, cover some some lost time, because I also think one of the most exciting things going forward are current future and proposed missions. And so one thing we've we've seen in the in the gamma ray community is that we have a lot of really good coverage from Fermi and there's a lot of good coverage at the higher end and there's planned telescopes that are coming online. But in this MEV range for space space gamma ray astronomy, there's a real gap. And so um, also motivated by the, the 4FGL with this 
more than a hundred unassociated sources or more than a thousand unassociated sources at low galactic latitude, um, a lot of these peak in the MEV range. And so what we really need is, is a new instrument in this MEV regime to not only understand what's happening in this region where there's been a gap, but also complement observations at higher and at lower energies that have had more coverage. And so right now there's a lot of current and proposed missions, uh, some of which are scheduled to fly in the next few years. Uh, so we have you know, gamma ray burst instruments like Polar and Burst Cube, a crystallite pathfinder, a COSY SMEX is a gamma ray instrument that's currently in phase A and they're waiting to see if they will be selected uh, for implementation. Um, Amigo X is an instrument that I'm the PI of, and this is a proposal that's going in this year. Uh, there's also uh, in instruments like Grams and Grain um, and APT that are also, these are, you know, more balloon-borne instruments. And the, the, the plan is that, you know, there's a really rich uh, framework. And, um, you know, I think it's a very exciting time to be looking at these kind of technologies. And so I'll really quickly do a summary. Um, the landscape has matured a lot over the years. Uh, there's many gamma ray telescopes in space currently uh, operating. Um, we learned that jets are very complicated from all the different sources, and that there's a lot of the similar questions that are coming from uh, many different communities. Um, because of this rich landscape, there have been many tools and pipelines uh, to develop and analyze the data, but also uh, to combine data across instruments. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of credit to be given to the software developers who are working on really analyzing this data to its fullest uh, extent. Um, and of course, you know, more telescopes, more data, more questions. So I think this is really motivating the community to look towards the future to try to understand where we're going to be going in the next uh, you know, in the next 10 years or so. And so I think there's a lot of really good opportunities for the future of space, space gamma ray astronomy. And so uh, thank you for listening. And hopefully uh, <laughs> I didn't go too far over. <laughs> Actually, you are well within the schedule. Okay. <laughs> so it was perfect. Thank you so much for such I tried, I tried. <laughs> So let me just see if the, we have some, some questions at the moment. Julie, you don't see any question in the, in the, in the chat for the questions, but I have a couple of them for, my, for myself. So I take the opportunity to, to ask them, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, I personally am pretty interested in the measurement uh, of polarization of gamma rays, let's say at moderately high energies, it's not uh, low energies. So uh, it's a bit more complicated than using the Compton effect. So I would like to know if you know of any mission in medium term looking for, for this, uh, just to study uh, the, the, the sources of the, the acceleration, acceleration. Yeah, so what, what energy are you thinking about specifically? Like um, MEV, KEV, all? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think it's a really good question. So I, I know, like I said, this uh, this Polar is planning to fly soon, and they they were kind of like the premier GRB one. Uh, Leap is also, which I, I didn't list here, which was kind of um, an oversight on my part, but that's also another GRB polarization mission that's currently in phase A, and it's it might be selected, you know, with, with this year. And so that's another uh, question. Um, I'm not 100% sure the, the polarization capabilities of COSY uh, SMEX, um, but, you know, in principle, it's a Compton telescope, and so that's something that, you know, would be able to measure some, some level of, of polarization at higher energies than, like, a few KEV. Um, uh, Amigo X also does have some polarization capabilities, especially for, like, HEN, so as opposed to, like, the really short transients, like the GRBs, um, it has some sensitivity to... Um, you know, longer duration um, gamma ray emitters. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, I would take also, I mean, we have a couple of more minutes. So uh, since I still see no, no questions, let me just ask another one. You sure. <laughs> so then I, uh, I don't know if you know, know my, my myself, but I am experimentalist in high energy side of the, of the thing. <laughs> And in the future, uh, we have truly profited from the, the overlap between uh, Fermi and the Cherenkov telescope. So Fermi will be 
let's say the commission at some moment. Yeah. Um, I would I would like to know if about about come if you can comment about uh, possible future telescopes that can can cover this this uh, overlapping region. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question, and and I think it's um it's challenging because I I agree for for me is operating now, and I fully agree that it's really been a revolution in having that overlap between the Shrankov telescopes and for me to understand really what's going on with uh, the high energy sources. Um, and, you know, as of right now, there isn't a plan follow on to Fermi, um, but I know that like the, the air shrink off telescopes, I think in particular CTA have been pushing to go to lower and lower energies. And so, you know, if they're able to get, you know, comfortably below hundred GeV, like down to say tens of GeV, like 30 or 50 or so. And we're able to have a new like kind of MEV telescope that can extend up into several GEV, then there's a way to have overlap there. It's kind of, you know, we we're probably not going to get another Fermi. <laughs> and so, I mean, you know, hopefully it's on orbit for a very long time, but I, I think that the prospect of a next generation Fermi is, is quite low. Um, just based on you know the cost and honestly the success of Fermi having something that could do better than it is is really really challenging um but targeting the lower energy to cover that regime and have it you know cross over into the GEV and then have the air shrink off telescopes kind of pick up at the higher end I, I think that that's the strategy that the community is going for okay thanks so much of course <laughs> so thank you so much I think uh uh, we are really on time, so thank you so much for so much uh, nice talk um, for answering the questions. So let's move to to Gabriela, Gabriela Zacharias that is going to give us a very nice talk. I promise you, I already watched it, so I mean, watch it. <laughs> Look at the slides; it's really nice. So thank you for um, and illustrate us. Thanks so much. Yes, yes, sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Uh, thank you <laughs> for seeing slides in advance. Thanks uh, organizers to, for invitations, invitation, and also to Regina for wonderful you know, introduction or like setting the stage for also for this talk. Um, yes, so I will, as, as, as also Regina said, uh, cover now uh, TV, uh, TV sky. So, so give a perspective on the topics uh, she already raised, but from higher energies. Um, just a second. All right. Uh, so I I placed a little bit of introduction just for maybe students that are not in the field, uh, and just wanted first to say uh, like uh, why uh, why TV gamma rays like for which science TV gamma rays are the most relevant. Uh, so this will not be you know the full list, but uh, just wanted to uh, sort of remind people that uh, about this interesting correction between cosmic rays and gamma rays. So of course. Uh, astrophysical processes accelerate cosmic rays, and then gamma rays are created in interactions of uh, charged cosmic rays with medium, with radiation fields, and so on. And so basically, by looking at gamma, at gamma rays, we can sort of understand, uh, you know, production, acceleration of cosmic rays. And also, we have this added advantage that, that gamma rays are coming in a straight line, so we basically can see and localize sources. Um, so in more detail, um, what I will sort of, the questions I will sort of focus on in this talk uh, that can be uh, answered with, with TV, uh, with TV gamma rays are, um, uh, for example, the origin of galactic cosmic rays. So as you know, I show here the, the classical plot of charged cosmic ray fluxes that cover energies from GV to 10 to the 20 EV or so, where we can see the spectral feature of a knee at few PV. Uh, and the standard theory is that lower energies, that cosmic rays, mostly protons below PV, are of galactic origin. But we yet, uh, at least, uh, you know, traditionally, uh, we're not sure Sure, we did not have the definite proof uh, of, of what those sources are. And then here is clear the TV uh, gamma rays are critical because if you're looking for PV protons, um, uh, they then produce gammas, you would expect gammas of hundreds of TV or larger energies. And basically, if you want them to understand what sources are actually accelerating protons here, we have to uh, you know, observe sources at 100 TV plus energies. And there has been progress in this field that I will mention here. 
Um, another another long-standing issue uh, uh, related to charged cosmic rays is the origin of positrons. Uh, as you know, uh, already for a decade or, or, or longer, uh, there is this sort of not really a puzzle, but this interesting measurement that positron fraction basically uh, is rising above 100 GV or so. So this is not something you would expect uh, if positrons were produced as secondaries. And it basically is indicating that there are some sources of positrons in a relative vicinity of the, of the Earth. And again, if you want to understand what is the source of these positrons, one hope is to look for gamma rays uh, that would be produced through inverse quantum interactions of those positrons and try to, to localize them. Again, this is something that also recently TV astronomy uh, might uh, show that it could actually answer uh, hopefully, if not right away in the a, in a near future. Uh, other, um, other connections that I will not focus too closely on uh, that are covered by Regina and Andre uh, um, uh, previously are the important connection between TV gamma rays uh, in the context of multi-messenger and multivalent astronomy uh, with neutrinos, overlapping neutrinos, and as a follow-up for gravitational wave events. And last, uh, but not the least, <laughs> is also the question of the nature of dark matter particles. So that will be covered in a different talk, but uh, since TV gamma rays are very critical for this topic, I will try to uh, at least mention it in the talk. All right, so first about the tools. Um, so uh, uh, one can divide instruments, as again Regina mentioned, in direct detection of gamma rays, uh, which are uh, which can be done by satellites and balloons, uh, since gamma rays cannot penetrate the atmosphere, so you have to go above uh, if you want to catch them directly. Um, on the other hand, uh, from the ground, uh, you, you do catch them indirectly, in a sense that uh, gamma rays create showers in the atmosphere, atmosphere, and then you sort of on the ground try to catch, uh, catch the shower particles. And that can be done via several techniques. So one is by using imaging uh, giant of telescopes. So basically, uh, cosmic rays, as they go through the atmosphere, they produce giant of light that then can be observed by sort of UV, uh, optical to UV telescopes. Um, on the other hand, if you want to sort of have a larger, larger array, instead of these uh, uh, telescopes, you can use water, uh, water tanks and basically observe charring of light inside of the water tanks um, in so-called water charring uh, detectors technique. And uh, if you want to go to larger energy steel uh, and have a larger and larger uh, areas uh, to, uh, to basically be able to detect uh, higher and higher energy gamma rays, uh, different then techniques can be used. For example, scintillators together with muon detectors, such as in Tibet as gamma ray, uh, and so on. So I will sort of briefly uh, comment on all of these techniques in the next few minutes. Uh, so basically, as I was saying before, uh, what happens with astrophysical flu fluxes, they basically fall off with energy, and so you have to go bigger and bigger. Um, and again, here I want to sort of to contrast the satellite, like Fermilat and Latinagile, with Cherenkov tel uh, telescope techniques, uh, current telescopes being HES, Magic Veritas, with Water Cherenkov, with the current Hawk, and then with these larger uh, telescope array, uh, cosmic ray arrays like Tibet, S Gamma, and since recently LASA. Uh, I will first confront these three, and then I have a couple of slides on the latest technique that basically pushes this measurement above 100 T. Um, uh, so basically, uh, what is the characteristic of satellites is that um, they have a large field of view and basically negligible cosmic ray contamination. So on a, for every gamma that basically uh, comes to Earth, there is there are orders of magnitude more protons uh, and, and, and electrons. And so you need to be able to somehow get rid of all this contamination. If you measure gamma rays directly, then you can do it basically on your instrument. You can, you can sort of detect and charge particle pass through. On the other hand, if you go, if you go as a satellite, you need to have a small effective area. Uh, 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 you cannot go very big. 
On the other hand, uh, for Cherenkov uh, technique, uh, uh, imaging Cherenkov technique, you, do, you can go big, so this, they have large effective area, uh, but uh, for, 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 for such approach, you need, uh, they're basically pointing telescopes. You do not have like, uh, like satellites or some of the other instruments, a uh, very large field of view, but, but you basically observe something like five by five or a bit somewhat larger uh, field of view at, at a single observation. You also need dark nights, uh, so you have relatively limited duty cycle, uh, but again, you reach very good angle resolutions and you, you reach uh, large enough effective areas. If you go to higher energies yet, uh, with water charging of technique, uh, you again uh, get to the, to the relatively large uh, field of view. So basically with Hawk, one can observe on, almost all the sky, uh, which is much, of course, larger than Cherenkov uh, uh, array. Uh, however, angle resolution is somewhat worse, uh, but it does have large duty cycle. Um, so these are all technical, uh, technical details, but will sort of result also in what kind of science can be, uh, can be then, uh, um, uh, discovered. Um, going to high res uh, energies, I wanted just to mention the, the new kid on the block, the very important new telescope, which is LASA, uh, which is sort of about to be completed or was completed in this, uh, in this period. Uh, this is a view in March 2021, but it was very rapidly built and is uh, and is you know fully functioning, uh, I believe, at the moment. Um, so this, uh, this telescope uh, basically combines uh, water Cherenkov, imaging Cherenkov, and scintillating like co cosmic ray array uh, technique. So basically it has three parts. It has a kilometer square array of scintillators and muon detectors. So this is huge. It allows to detect um, cosmic rays with very large effective areas. So it reaches very high sensitivities. And you can, as you can see here, so basically you see this is sensitivity of magic and yes, uh, up to TV a few TVs or so, Hawk takes over, but then Lasso and Tibet uh, are, are becoming dominant uh, at hundreds of TVs and larger energies. So this large area of scintillators allows them to do that. And having new detectors, they can basically determine cosmic ray background and basically work in quite background free uh, and, and background free way. Uh, then a smaller array here, a water Cherenkov, which is like Hawk-like, uh, about three times bigger. And by that, there are also wide field of view uh, Cherenkov telescope arrays. So basically this allows the lasso to cover uh, a quite wide energy range. Um, and so how about the future from instrumental side? Uh, so this is also a plot shown by Regina. Here is Fermi, here Cheren current. Um, now here is current Cherenkov telescopes, Hawk, um, Lasso, uh, and then for the future we do have uh, basically CTA uh, that, should, that basically should improve the sensitivity of current imaging Cherenkov telescopes in these uh, hundreds of GV to hundreds of TV to hundreds of TV sort of range, uh, and there is also SW Go uh, that is. Um, next generation Hawk-like uh, detector uh, that will be placed in the Southern Hemisphere and be able to cover uh, most of the galactic plane in the galactic center. So I will focus, when I talk now about the results, physics results of current telescopes, I will also comment about what the future will bring us, mainly focusing on CTA. Uh, just in few words, the CTA, um, the main characteristics uh, is to reach a whole sky coverage by placing two arrays in the south and north, um, and uh, also to reach wide energy coverage by combining different size telescopes. There will be three kinds of telescopes, large, medium, and small, that will basically allow to cover from smallest to highest energies. Um, in this, in this energy range that the CTA covers. Uh, and high telescope multiplicity allows then for, to, for improved angle resolution. And we will see for, for uh, more varied observational strategies uh, with respect to current uh, imaging chunk of telescopes. Uh, all this will be, I will use later when I talk about the science. Uh, so how about the science? 
uh, how does GV versus TV sky look like? So as we move here from sort of LAT sky above 300 MeV towards uh, LAT sky above 10 GV, so already going to higher energies to sort of uh, a sky above 100 GV, the picture changes. As, you were, as I was saying, the fluxes fall down. So while one has around 5,000 sources above 300 MeV, these numbers fall in energy uh, coming to about 200 or uh, more, uh, or, or some more uh, at, at TV energy range. Uh, similarly, uh, this diffuse emission, which, which is produced by galactic cosmic ray in, in interactions with uh, galactic uh, medium and fields, that is very bright in Fermi range, it's hard to detect um, at higher energies. One, because of this high cosmic ray contamination, and of course, because you have less and less photons, so it's, it's, it's really challenging, but very important uh, measurement, so I will also talk about this. So what are then the take-home messages here? So TV sky is challenging, uh, but uh, you know there are, there are very important new discoveries uh, in terms of, of catalogs, uh, new source classes. Uh, and then also I will tell some, something about the prospects for, for detecting these diffuse or extended image. Uh, and as Regina was saying about extra galactic, I, I might mention uh, the TV uh, ground based astronomy role, but uh, that was covered already by Regina to a great extent. So if you look at the cat, uh, at the catalog of TV sources, so what are the main source classes? That's quite similar to what also Fermi sees. Um, basically, here I show magic sources, but it's it's representative of the general trend that among extragalactic sources we have FSRQs and BLAX, uh, mostly AGNs, and among galactic sources there are supernova remnant pulsars and pulsar in, uh, and pulsar in nebulae. Um, so because galactic sources are mostly in the plane, important uh, effort has, uh, was made by uh, Cherenkov, imaging Cherenkov telescopes to do the, the surveys of galactic plane. Uh, basically, as I was saying before, uh, these telescopes are pointing, so they look at a particular source. However, if they do, when they do surveys, that allows them to do the to get an unbiased view of the sky. So they just scan the galactic plane and look for sources in an unbiased way. And indeed, uh, has galactic plane survey uh, added 16 new sources in the plane, for example, uh, and uh, we can prove that uh, angle resolution, um, uh, bringing therefore important discoveries at that time. Here I wanted to mention that in the future, CTA uh, plans to take up on this uh, on this idea, on this approach, and to have a dedicated galactic plane survey that will have uh, around 480 hours in the first two years and 1140 hours in the following eight years. Uh, the idea is that it will sort of increase the source count by the factor three to five. So for example, these are the sources detected by HES, and this is what is expected for CTA in terms of pulsar nebulae, for example. You can see uh, more details in this uh, ICRC presentation. Uh, so how about new source classes? So if you look uh, at TEVCAT and Fermi, we see that pulsars, so at light energies, pulsars are the most dominant galactic sources, while at TV energies, these are pulsar nebulae, supernova remnants, sort of sources related to similar processes. So the idea is that when, you know, a supernova goes off, pulsar is formed uh, at early stages for very young pulsars, uh, pulsar nebulae are yet contained and still Contain within, within supernova remnant and electrons and positrons produced by pulsar remain closed and, um, and, and contain close to the pulsar nebulae. As, as the system ages, uh, the electrons are sort of released into the interstellar medium. Uh, and how exactly, uh, uh, with what spectrum they're released, how exactly all this happens, it was not clear. And it's still not clear, and it's a big question. Uh, it was uh, suggested, it was believed and also suggested by Milagro observations uh, some years back that once when uh, for middle age pulsars, uh, these electrons can uh, sort of stay relatively locally, but outside of pulsar influence in the interstellar medium and produce so-called TV halos. And those were indeed um, uh, excitingly discovered um, 
uh, by Hawke, uh, which, uh, which discovered uh, uh, this passage, uh, TV halos around Geminga and, um, and Monogem. Um, and uh, importantly noticed by measuring the profile. So basically here are the pulsars, TV emission is extended uh, around 20 parsecs or so around those sources. And from this extension, one can see, assuming the diffusion uh, uh, is at play uh, together with energy losses, uh, one can sort of in, uh, calculate what is the diffusion coefficient close to these sources. And what was a surprising thing is that it was realized the diffusion coefficient is seemed to be towards the magnitude lower uh, than the general one uh, uh, induced from the whole galaxy that we believe is the average value in our galaxy. Uh, and so why is that important? So first, it suggests, it suggests the diffusion of particles in Milky Way is likely homogeneous, that one might, as natural actually to assume, close to sources that you might have a, a different diffusion coefficient than maybe farther away from sources. So observation of these uh, TV uh, hills allows us to study, to, to you know, eventually get the full picture in this respect. Um, also, it, it, it should allow us to understand how this transport of particles works. So there are important works by Ricky et al. Uh, recently suggesting that maybe diffusion is not yet dom still dominant process, but in part uh, uh, also ballistic motion uh, is relevant here. So again, we do not have a final word on that, but discovering more systems like this will, uh, will, allow, will allow us to understand how, what exactly happens to electrons as pulsars age and they, and they uh, propagate farther out. Uh, another important thing is this positron excess or positron ri rise of positrons that sort of uh, suggests their sources of positron close by us. And in fact, by observing these TV halos, it's clear that electrons sort of escape from, uh, from these uh, from pulsars uh, and are naturally could explain positron spectrum. Of course, then the question is about the diffusion coefficient. One has to understand how it could actually work, but, um, but it's important piece of uh, information. Uh, to understand uh, the sources of positrons. Uh, since then, Hawke realized uh, uh, we had an, uh, a handful or dozens of new candidates for TV halos, was able to determine, uh, at least to try to find the diffusion coefficient in three energy beams. Very important work uh, by uh, Di Mauro and collaborators from Fermi data. Uh, they, they managed to detect the TV halo and determine diffusion coefficient. Uh, and so the, the thing is, uh, the field is really growing. Um, uh, so what is important here, I just wanted to mention exactly in, the, in between Hope and Fermi, the, the CTA uh, sort of will start operating and should be sensitive to these halos. In fact, uh, there was a talk by Veronica uh, in parallel session for the work showing that basically a large portion of this is this is the population study of TV halos and the sensitivity of CTA to those. So the the hope or the idea is that uh, CTA will discover hundreds of such objects that would allow us to actually study all these questions in detail. Uh, galactic pevatrons. I guess I have sort of five minutes or so. Uh, so the question of galactic pevatrons. Um, basically, I, I was telling you we need to find. So sources of PV, of PV protons, basically, in order to understand the origin of, cosmic, of galactic cosmic rays. So the first sort of pevatrons in galaxy, basically, was not a supernova remnant that people were, were thinking about, but uh, was discovered uh, by Hess observation of the galactic center, uh, where it seems that there is gamma ray emission that is coincident with clouds, which suggests that this, you know, proton origin, protons interacting with, with, with protons in a cloud producing gamma rays with ion decay. So, so these seem to be uh, gamma rays due to uh, hadronic gamma rays, hadronically produced gamma rays emission in the two degrees around the galactic center. And with such spectrum that basically seems to be uh, extending uh, uh, without a sign of a clear cutoff. So basically, um, it's it's supposed uh, it's it's it seems it's uh, that it's reaching PV energies. Uh, so that was the first the first indication in 2016. But the most recent results uh, from Lasso actually uh, Lasso observed 12 sources. Uh, that had energies above, uh, that, that emitted photons above 100 TVs. Uh, 
and basically in total it had 530 photons of these enormous energies. So uh, showing that uh, and those photons reach up to 1.4 PV. Uh, and so the, the, the evidence for these pavatons in the galaxy uh, seem to be uh, now quite solid. Uh, in fact, uh, three brightest sources uh, exhibit spectra that does not show any spectral cutoff. So indeed could, uh, is believed that they do emit gamma rays up to PV energies. Uh, the origin of these gamma rays is that the protons or electrons is not settled yet, uh, but it's uh, definitely a new era. Uh, this is just the first year of incomplete uh, lasso. So, so many more results should come in, uh, in this respect. Uh, so these gamma ray emitters are, uh, these 12 sources are in the vicinity of your usual suspects such as possibly nebulae, supernova remnants. Uh, Crab Nebula is, is the only one detected uh, uh, as, a, as a source, but also star forming region. So also site Cygnus cocoon uh, is um, uh, seem to be uh, emitting this very high energy balance. I just wanted to mention that before this last so impressive discovery, also Hawk and also Tibet are a uh, sort of a reaching, we're getting there. For example, Tibet uh, had gamma ray, this is, this is these are gamma ray events in this high energy range, already suggested this path. So in the last two minutes, I'll try to be very, very quick, uh, just to finish sort of about galactic gamma ray astronomy. Another very important thing, uh, as I was saying, is to understand together with these TV halos, like how cosmic rays are uh, accelerated close by sources, what is the cosmic ray population in the galaxy? So how, how, how they're behaving after they diffuse out and, and basically confined for, to our galaxy. So this high energy diffuse emission is hard to detect at high energies. Uh, as I was saying, again, there are these exceptions, for example, this galactic region emission, uh, Milagro detected uh, some diffuse emission, uh, uh, has detected cumulative emission around the galactic plane, but having such, you know, uh, being able to basically see pixel by pixel how this diffuse emission is very hard at TV energies. Um, uh, so CTA, together with the Galactic Plane Survey and also the Extra Galactic Survey that I will not talk about here uh, due to the lack of time, we'll also have the Galactic Center dedicated survey. So it will observe sort of 10 degrees around the Galactic Center with deep exposure of 500 hours or so in a larger region with 300 hours or so. So there is not yet a careful study of this issue. Uh, CTA people are working on that, but there are some indications from early work that basically the diffuse emission as the one detected by Fermi could be detectable uh, with CTA um, in, quite, in quite detail. Uh, this also brings us to the question of dark matter because also dark matter would be sort of extended signal uh, in the sort of broadly galactic center region. So this is something Francesca will tell you much more tomorrow. But I just wanted to say that while we're on the topic of CTA and this galactic center survey observation, that basically also for dark matter TV telescopes uh, are very important because uh, it seems that they should detect sort of your standard WIMP, one of the most popular candidates in this TV range, exactly, you know, in the most popular uh, parameter space. So again, I expect Francesca will tell you more tomorrow, but I just wanted to mention it here. Um, Okay, so I should wrap up. So in terms of extragalactic uh, astronomy, uh, TV telescopes observe basically a local sky. This is a bit different from Fermi and from low energy uh, detectors. Um, and so you can see that we close by sources. Um, uh, they're critical uh, in the, in the multi-messenger era, for example, for the discover, for, for the connection with neutrino uh, gamma rays for the Texas. Uh, AGN, and also uh, very importantly, GRBs. Uh, GRBs are now being discovered by T, uh, at TV range, first by MAGIC uh, and then by HES, uh, also allowing to sort of understand better the emission of afterglow of GRBs. Again, uh, Regina talked about uh, GRBs. I just wanted to mention here that now we finally, for the first time, have few, the first data points in the TV uh, regime um, for, or, or above 100 GB for, for GRBs. And this is just the beginning again, uh, expectations with CTA and next generation telescopes. You'll also have lots to say here. Uh, 
Okay, so I finish here with the genus <laughs> sentence, more telescopes, more data, more questions, because indeed now with all these discoveries that I mentioned, uh, many more questions arose, uh, but that just means it still is exciting. Also entering the PV era, now we have, um, you know, we are extending this energy range to higher energies and next generation experiment relevant with it. So I will just thank you all for listening and, and stop here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for such a good talk. Uh, very interesting. You gave a very nice overview of the field. Mm -hmm. So now it's time for questions. Let me just check. We have some questions in the chat. I don't see any questions. So I will again profit from this opportunity to ask you a couple of them. And I, I, mine, the first one, I mean, is maybe a, a bit out of scope. But I would like to understand if you if you can explain that. What is the the what is uh, let's say the consequences in in, in the in the possible uh, positron flux that we can detect uh, around Earth due to the the difference on the on the diffusion coefficient between what we expect from the standard models of propagation. And the measurements uh, with this difficult galactic sources. Right. So yeah, this is a good question, and I think also in the audience there are many people that also work on that. Uh, could chime in, uh, chime in if, uh, you know, with the answer if they if they wish. So so um, so the idea is that Jiminga and Monagem are basically sort of the closest. They were the usual suspects to be behind this positive the rise of the positive fraction. Okay, people did expect, and this is actually a very natural uh, assumption, that Jiming and Monogen could actually explain the positron uh, fraction rise as observed by AMS, so two Pamela and others. Um, now with this realization about TV halos and that diffusion coefficient is much smaller, close by sources, this, this adds information in, term, in, in the sense that if such small coefficient uh, will not be only about source uh, around sources, but would be no local volume from those sources all the way up to us. Then basically, Koch group showed that then Jiming and Monogem could not uh, on their own explain the positron spectrum. And so basically, now we have these two candles to play. We have positron measurement. We have this measurement by the sources by Koch. We have the measurement of diffusion coefficient all around the galaxy by say Fermi or MS or two. And so we just have to now, basically the simplest models also do not work anymore. So probably it is not true that diffusion coefficient is just the same. You know, it might not be true that we have, so, so far we always assume there is one number for diffusion coefficient, like we work in this very calcal approximation. Now with all this data, we have to get in more realistic models and sort of, I, I believe that the hope is that now with discovering many more such objects, you'll understand much better how this source, this cosmic phase are sort of accelerated, what spectra they have, what is diffusion, diffusion closer, farther from sources, and then we'll actually get a very realistic explanation of what are the sources exactly define this positive measurement, you know, how they're distributed and how this cosmic phase are propagating, uh, you know, from the source up to us. I hope that this is a satisfactory yeah. answer if somebody wants to comment. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, satisfactory enough. Yeah? Just open the door to, to get more, <laughs> more, more journals and understand what's going on. But let me just check if there's some other question. If not, I will. Ah, yes. This yeah, second question this is Any connection to the matter in the PIF range that you know of? Uh, yeah. We use uh, PIF data to test some interesting material, explore DM models, and or to improve our knowledge on the ones currently under scrutiny. Mm. Yeah, good, good question. Thanks, Miguel. Um, right, so this is, so I did not think much about PV dark matter. Um, it's usually assumed that it should be decaying dark matter in that case. Um, and I know that uh, Pasquale, Serpico, and others worked a little, I mean, somewhat on heavier dark matter in relation to neutrino events. And so, yes, I think you're right. I mean, in a sense, Miguel, your intuition that now with opening of the PV sky, um, 
you know, we can mm -hmm. actually for the first time actually look for PV dark matter. So yes, I did not think yet about this, but I could imagine this will be a trend, uh, you know, in five or in a few years. Um, time. Okay, thank you for the, for the nice answer. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, <laughs> by Miguel Angel <laughs> Sanchez Conde, the host of mine, sorry. So I think we can go to a last question uh, that we have here is that, could you please also comment on dampening, like it says, at 1.4 teraelectron volts? Mm -hmm. Is it anomalous and my indicator was dark matter? So yes, thanks, Simon. Um, uh, for the question, I am uh, not sure. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think it's probably more question for Francesca tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. But um, right, so so the line like excess. Uh, I forgot what was the significance uh, of the line discovery. Um, uh, and so I think I think there have been works to explain it as a dark matter. Uh, but but given that that signal was a bit um, sort of excluded maybe or challenged by other experiments, I, I, I'm not aware of of, of lots of uh, different ideas in that direction. But yeah, let's let's watch out more for Francesca's talk. Maybe yeah, maybe I'm not super updated on the question. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, then Gabriela. I think it's time just to close the session. Thank so you. Please. Uh, let me remind you that uh, we have now discussion panels uh, for the pre corporate uh, sessions, and uh, it will be followed by a second post session. So please uh, connect to them using the platform of the conference and, uh, and enjoy them. So thanks so much and have a good day. <laughs>